Hi, my name is Matt Perez. I'm here in Hatchery Life, and Jose is in Portugal, so he will not be joining us today. And we have Leo, which is, ah, there he is. Um, How you doing? He's, uh, he's our guest today, and we did a little bit of chatting in the background, and, and it seems like we're, we're aligned in a lot of things. And, um, and that's that. So uh, ask your questions on the, in, the, in the chat, and I'll try to translate them here. And by all means, read the book. Yeah, I press right hand, the correct hand. And the book is called Radical Companies Without Bosses or Employees. And I'll let you find out what that is. So, Leo, welcome to the show. And, and, uh, and t tell us about your, what you do in, in, for the earth and, and stuff like that. Hi, Matt. And thanks for, thanks for having me on. It's a real, um, a real treat to be here uh, from the other side of the, uh, the Atlantic and, and, and the States. Uh, I started this company, Eden Lab, um, last year, but I've been harboring it for a long time. You know, when you have an idea in your mind or in your heart and you know you need to do it. Yep. And um, I, just, I just could see that there was an opportunity to think differently about how we, how we handle the challenge of climate change and or some people call it climate breakdown and, and how we might speed up the process of, of reacting to it, adapting to it, preventing it, reducing it. Um, and I could just see a gap. I could just see a gap. And I can tell you the story, if you like, of where I came from. I mean, yeah, it please, might be worth saying, please, but please. like I'd been in marketing and advertising for a long time. Because when I was young, it looked cool and it was fun and we made videos and music and it seemed like a, it seemed like a fun thing to do. But slowly, I guess, over that period of time, and it was a long time, like decades, I began to become, particularly more recently, you know, much more aware of what was happening in our, our world around us. And I would look in my kids' eyes and kind of question whether what I was doing with my talent or whatever such as they are was really, you know, doing enough good and valuable enough and helpful enough to the world and my kids. And I was working, go on, you want to jump in? No. And I, and I was working in a particular moment, I was working on a project for a big food company, big American owned food company, like it's in everyone's kitchens. And um, we were helping them tell their sustainability story. Now this wasn't greenwash. This wasn't saying things that weren't true. And we'd done, we'd been really careful and we'd done a really careful audit and we got specialist help and we were really clear that we weren't lying about what they were doing. But as I finished that project, I realized that sure we might have helped them tell the story, their sustainability story, but nothing had changed in the company. And I had this phrase in my mind that was like, we're just painting deck chairs green on the Titanic. Um, and I just knew there had to be another way. And that was the genesis of, of a change in lifestyle, a change in life, and, a, and the birth of a new company called Eden Lab. Good for you. Um, so that was your, your transformation moment. Uh, so what do you do? What does Eden Lab do? Yeah, so we work with big companies to make them more sustainable and sustainable companies to make them bigger, right? So I'm really, really keen. I've set myself and we've set ourselves a goal to remove and um, reduce 5 million tons of greenhouse gas over the next five years, which is, you know, it's not an insubstantial number. It's something like, let's say, 5 million flights from New York to London, say. Um, but how do you achieve that? And it's really like, it's a bit, for me, that's a bit, I, mean, I was one guy. We were, I mean, it's bigger now, there's more of us now, but it was one person to start with. How do you do that? And two ways. One is you work with big organizations that are polluters and you help them stop doing it and find better ways to do it. Or, and this I think is harder, but possibly where we end up, helping really small enterprises that have or people that have a, an exponentially powerful idea for how they might remove carbon from the atmosphere to grow quick, quicker, to get to scale far. So, but look, at the end of the day, we're all going to face, I believe we're all going to face into this challenge one way or another, whether we like it or not in the coming five, 10, 20 years, like, and it will be, to me, it's going to be bigger than digital, which I know sounds crazy, but maybe we can talk about that later. But, I, um, I agree. I agree. 
And then you have to say, well, what skills have you got that you can use? And mine happen to be, I'm quite good at thinking strategically and planning, and I'm quite good at uh, being good at changing behavior and shaping aspiration and helping companies innovate over 20 years. So can I repurpose that stuff in a way that might be useful? And that's that's kind of where we are. So we work with uh, some big companies in some difficult sectors, like household care, detergent, like travel. I mean, travel is re a real problem. Like the plane is... The plane is the elephant in the room when it comes to decarbonizing travel. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure you know that. And, um, but we're also working with food companies and we work with um, the smaller firms and just trying to find ways to help them not go out of business, but sort of switch the way they make their money from, I call it, create a clean share of market. Clean How should you move from, yeah, because at the moment you've got a dirty share of market and so do your competition. Yeah. How would you have a clean share? How would you but, find a way? So I'm trying to draw people through to the future through seeing that they can have a viable business in the future. And my, my guess, I might be wrong, but my guess is we will work in organizations of people and we can discuss with you like how they're organized. That's a thing. But that people will probably need jobs and people will probably want to get paid somehow, somehow in, in 10, 20 years time. So how do we use that for good rather than for evil? That's you know that's part of that philosophy for me. So, but how do you avoid the greenwashing that happened before in the big food, bad American company? Um, yeah. Because I see I talk to somebody in private, not here in the in the podcast, uh, who is an ESG expert, whatever that mm -hmm. means for. And um, yeah. this is the problem with ESG is that there's a thousand ways of working around that in cheating yeah, right. and greenwashing yeah. and yeah. and Paul Allard who I think was the first or the second person we talked to said oh what I do is simple I show him a list of companies that are bullshit and, and and I show him a list of companies that are good that I've realized that you know I, I've identified as, as yes they when they say they plant a tree they plant a tree and when they say they get rid of a cow they get rid of a cow um, so how do you avoid that, in, in, particularly in a big company, which I tend to say big, bad company, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really hard. Like, it's really hard. And not, not least because they're, they're the pro I mean, they're the product of a certain system that we operate in or we live in today. You know, I think we're both interested in changing. Um, and that system is stacked up to operate in a certain way and they were successful in the system and the system doesn't necessarily favor doing things the way it's good for the planet or people really deep down. Right. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, it, the, the context, the water in which they swim is kind of, kind of challenging. For me personally, like, and this is going to sound like, um, maybe it's going to sound like um, too human in a way. I don't know if that's the right word, but for me, like a lot of it comes down to, do you feel that you have trust in the integrity and intention of the person you're dealing with? Because mm -hmm. in any group of humans, there are some people on a, you know, like a spectrum from probably evil to angelic. And mm -hmm. uh, how do you align yourself with the progressive change agents who have the ability to make influence, that have the ability to drive change, that maybe have a track record of making change happen before, that have energy that have vision or prepared to be curious about how the world could be different and a vested interest in the future helps. I mean, not everyone has that. So often what we're doing, I think is identifying those sorts of people. And I, I used to think when I was starting this business, like would we, this enterprise, would we work with a certain category or a certain role in a company? And the answer is uh, not necessarily. I think it's with a certain kind of psych psychological attitude. And then you have to have your wits about you. Like I, some people say we should help fossil fuel companies, you know, the big oil companies transition. But my personal view is I, I'm not going to do that for, for a bunch of reasons, not least of which is I think Eden Lab is too small at the moment to make significant difference in, in what they're doing. Do I think that there are businesses that might be in dirty sectors that one would want to work with and try and help? Then, then yeah, and I'll tell you why, because it's also my belief that in 20 years' time, climate breakdown or otherwise, and I'm expecting it to come, um, I think I'm going to need to probably wash my clothes somehow. So mm -hmm. how am I going to get that done? Uh, and maybe we'll come up with some amazing technology that solves the problem of carbon in clothes washing, but it's not there yet. Or I'm probably going to need to buy a pair of, um, 
I don't know if you, what you guys call them in the States. Do you call them underpants? <laughs> like your undergarments, your short, your trunks, your shorts. Like, I'm being silly, but kind of not, because like, where is that coming from? In We have to get it from somewhere. Maybe we'll knit them ourselves, or you might grow it in the garden. I don't know, but what the future holds. But my view is that we're going to still need some of these basic commodities. So I would rather switch all of us to buying them from people who are doing yeah. it in a safe, kind, generous, inclusive way, rather than buying them from some exploitative supply chain that doesn't care about its environment, that's destroying the, bio, the, the biodiversity and the production of the product. So, and, and eventually, who knows? And, and eventually that, that will be a distinction, a differentiator uh, for companies to say, hey, we, we do things the right way. To, and here's all the data. You know, we're transparent to so here is all the yeah. data. Um, that will that will um, buy them competitiveness, I guess. And, and oh, God, I hate that word. And and um, yeah. Well, it, g- it gives them a right to survive, a right to play, probably in the future, as opposed to getting. I think there's lots of people working in businesses right now that are there's I call them zombie companies. Uh, and there may be a financial definition, but my definition is they're already dead. You just don't know it yet, but they're working in a dead enterprise. Like mm-hmm. it's, it, does, it won't be around in 10 years time because things will have changed so much that um, if you're not playing the game the right way and you're not ahead of the curve and thinking what's coming next, you're kind of out, you're going to be out of business. Right. This ESG thing that you mentioned, I mean, we should touch on it. Like in case anyone doesn't know, you know, it's that environmental, social and governance kind of way of thinking. And it's really an investment mindset and it's thinking about handling risk and thinking about risk i'm sure you know this and and, um and the problem with it is it's scored in a thousand different ways um at the moment and therefore it's not really clear how can exxon have at some point had a better score on esg than tesla i mean i mean you guys will know more about those companies they're they're from your part of the world than mine but that doesn't make sense and so for me it's been a useful pressure point in the world but i think there are other more interesting ones coming um, that will force much more radical transparency, much more inclusive models of, of doing business because we'll be, we'll be forced to get there. You know, I'm kind of a visionary and prophet of doom, in equal, like a utopian and a doomist at the same time, which is a strange place to inhabit, but um, I think that's a healthy place to be. No, it's a healthy kind of thing because we either end up in one or the other. Um, and right now we're heading for the doom side. Uh, because we're focused on money so much and um, that's the all that counts. So the, your, your uh, gas companies and, and those kinds of companies, no matter what you say, they're going to go, but we're going to make less money in the next quarter. And we have to, I have to report to the board that we're going to make more money next yeah. quarter. Yeah. And that stops all the arguments. And then comes the, the greenwashing. Is uh, can we do something to make it look like? You know, they don't say it that way, but um, but that, that's the problem. And and now now my part, of what I told you that we tried to uh, frame it from a, yeah. a, a radical perspective. Yeah. Where our approach is really simple: is you start with people, and then you experiment. And, and then um, you have co-ownership and, co- co- co-ownership and co-management on top of that. And you need tools and stuff like that. Um, so a lot, of what you were, a lot of what you were hoping for, a lot of, a lot of what you're um, trying to do strikes me as being in line with that in the sense that, um, yeah, we want to see companies get Better. I, I, I have no problem with bigger. I have no problem with money. Um, but businesses, and I make a distinction, businesses have to become companies. And the reason I make the distinction is companies come from the word, from the Latin com, compant, and uh, it's breaking bread together. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. So, so people that break bread together mm-hmm. won't do anything stupid like put shit in their sandwich and hand it to the other guy because the guy's seeing <laughs> which is just put scrubbing shit. Oh, but it's bigger. It's yeah. bigger. Don't you want a bigger sandwich? And um, 
And so that's the point that we want to get it to without going back to, you know, indigenous values or working the land with, with oxen and stuff like that, because that was, that was part of the problem. Um, yeah. So, but there are ways to do it. We're, we live in the 21st, 21st century, but we're treating things as if we're in the R and H. And we're not in the R and H anymore. We're in the 21st century. We have computers that fit in our pockets, supercomputers. When I started, this was, this is probably like a th more than a thousand times what I started with. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it was a big thing. It was a big crack. Um, so we carry those things in our pockets. They're connected to, I mean, we're talking to you in the UK and you would not. Um, yeah. And um, so let's take advantage of all that to create communities around the world and, and, and then create companies that are transparent, completely transparent. And transparency will lead to decentralization, is my, my belief. Like, yeah, um, I'm, I'm with you on that. I really think that um, if I can build on your thought, like it's really, it's particularly critical in respect to the challenges we face here because the challenges are systemic. Yes. No one company or one person can resolve it. No one component in the value chain has enough influence to really do it. And yes, but and that's why your point about competition being perhaps a, an interesting, challenging word in this world is, is, is because in a way we have to find ways to. Is that phrase pre-competition? Have you heard of that? So it's where organizations or types of people get together way before they go to market to try and work out how they're going to fix the overall supply chain. Like, but the principle is, unless we collectively try and solve, whether it's where your underpants or your shorts come from, or whether it's um, how we decide to fuel our villages and cities and our vehicles, right? Um, unless we do it in a companion-like way, I suspect. Yeah, I think we're probably not going to achieve it. It's interesting to me, and I'm, you know, I could be, I could be more on this than I am. I need to learn more about it, and don't we all? But um, the really more radical end of the climate activist movement over here in in the UK, and they do kind of went through quite a big phase of shutting London down and moved on to different tactics now. But one of their main things they're advocating for is a citizens' assembly. I don't know if people talk about the citizens' assembly in in the states. No, that phrase that's being used. And, and so what it is, is this idea that if you got everyone together in the room in a very representative way, mm -hmm. then you would um, you would have a conversation, an honest conversation about what needs to happen. And you would get to a place where broader systems change could be enabled. But whilst you don't allow that dialogue and discussion and kind of coming together to occur, then you're just constantly doomed to repeating kind of the power systems yes. that currently exist. And there's a lot to be said for it. Although I've also seen... And I've seen it very personally, big groups of people coming together in a democratic way and making some pretty bad decisions in my point of view, like Brexit. Yeah. So um, yeah. it's not as easy as it sounds. Yeah, the, the um, what, what was it, Occupy Wall Street or whatever? The, the, yeah, right. The big criticism that. was that they didn't have a boss. And I was thinking, that's the future, not, not a bug. But they didn't have, that's it, they didn't have a bug and they didn't have any alternatives to it. And um, one, of the, one of the tools that we make a big deal out of is, is the RADS uh, mobile app. Again, we're carrying this thing. And um, if I see you making a contribution of any sort, then I recognize the contribution right away. And at the end of the month, those contributions get translated to RADS, which it might be a bad name, but it's all I could think of. Um, and, and then those threads become the, the percentage factor that things get distributed as that. So as you get revenue, you you are a co-owner. So you are the owner of the revenue, but you don't get all of it. You get only as much, as many as those contributions represented in mm -hmm. RAS and uh, and, and gets sugared one way, and then next month it gets sugared a different way. It's dynamic. It's not static like shares and crap like that. Um, mm -hmm. So, in in it, well, there's a guess. It will motivate people to contribute more, to contribute things that 
people will recognize and contribute more. And, um, you know, I'm sure bad things can come out of it because we were very creative. Human beings are very creative that way. Mm -hmm. but, um, but I can't think of any. I cannot think of any. Um, well, I think here's one. Here's one. It's not a, it's not, um, it's something to work with rather than a, pu a pushback. No, it's not that. But it's like, um, you know how the Chinese, in the Chinese state system, there is, it's about who does the scoring, like who works out what a rat, what a, I'm sure you've done this work, but what, what a unit, what is a behavior worth rewarding and what isn't, is, cru is crucial, isn't it? So at the, actually at the moment in our world, acquisition, making money, driving a big car gets reward, is part of a sort of reward system. Status is a re an unhealthy reward system, perhaps. Right. I'm just thinking about the Chinese, the Chinese uh, sort of social controls around behaviors and monitoring the citizens and how that can earn you points or delete you points based on, you know, your behavior. And your, yeah, but we're not how, about, how do you prevent that being? Yeah, we're not talking about control. Bastard? We're talking yeah. about recognition of contributions. Yeah. So if, okay, here's one. So uh, back up to 1944, but we have phones. Okay, we have these things, um, and uh, what was the word? Hitler, I don't know, whenever Hitler started, and everybody started to contribute to, to recognize contributions for Hitler because they were really in pain, and, and you guys said some of the fault in the French have some of the fault and all that stuff, and we have some of the fault too, but uh, they were really poor, really fucked up. And, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and Hitler was saying wonderful things, you know, like, we're going to not make you poor. What Hitler yeah. wasn't saying is, that's by taking the wealth and giving it to you. Um, and um, and he would be getting contributions for that. So it's one way to game the system. To, and it's a way to motivate people to do more like Hitler. Because that was... Uh, well preserved in the, in the localized economy, in the localized in a country where the boundaries are well defined, all that stuff. But this thing is doing away with one boundaries. Yeah. I mean, well, I'm talking to you in the UK. I get friends that I talk to in I don't know where he's at today. He travels all over the place. I talk to a guy uh, a bed in Dubai, and. Um, I know people from all over the world, so we w I wouldn't do anything with that community that would damage people from their community over there and stuff like that. So it's more of, of motivating people to giving people a reason to be motivated to do more of the good things. Oh, every time I, I talk to somebody or I mentor somebody or I correct with somebody there or I get I get points, I get contributions. And if I don't, and I'm doing those things, I get to ask, well, you didn't get, I, I didn't get recognition from anybody. It's, we didn't notice. You know, so you learn to communicate more. You know, mm -hmm. the, and stuff like that. So I think mm -hmm. overall, uh, it, it's, it, in any case, it's the alternative to fiat, which is because I say so. Yeah, there's no more. I say so. Is we decide to go that way, and maybe maybe not so bad or not so good, <clears throat> or we go to go this way, and it's maybe good. But as a group, with transparency, people people will not people will not pee in their stream that they drink from. Mm. And and when everybody's peeing in their stream because oh look, it's mixed yellow. Um, Somebody, a corner, will, will come up and say, oh, that's not such a good idea because I lift down the stream and I drink that, that yellow. And I don't want to drink that yellow. So please stop peeing. And, um, and again, because it's one of the communities saying that it's more believable, it's not people scaring, it's not Fox News, it's not, um, you guys have a similar one in the UK, but I don't know what it is. And, um, yeah. It's not an anonymous source of bullshit. It's somebody that you work with, that you break bread with every day. And, uh, 
you tend to credit source the better. Uh, my 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 guess. Yeah. Is, uh, help me. Help me think something through then, because I'm that's, you know, I like that, and I'm really interested in how we can make it work harder and further and stuff. So one one of the challenges that I think we collectively need to get our heads around and and live with is at the moment um, people don't pay the real price of the things they buy. Yes. Right. So so no, the company isn't paying for the water it draws out of the ground. It doesn't pass it on to you in price. It doesn't pay for the carbon it's emitting. It passes it on. Doesn't pass on the price of that to you. You don't have to take account of how much you're using or not using. It's kind of we would like you to sort of spend less carbon and ruin the world less. But hey, it's not, there's no control. So we, well, there's no kind of uh, restriction. And we need to move to a space where collectively we all agree that actually, I mean, it's going to happen sooner or later, right? By the way, but it's a question of how yes. we get there. I think. Yes. Um, yes. We have to pay the price. We uh, sooner or later we are going to have to pay somehow the real price of things and that may mean that yeah you're not taking that long haul flight because it's just you've done your thing this year and collectively we've agreed that's enough it's kind of how do you how does one get to that level of um, a transition in it as i'm fascinated by how do you get to that place in a way that feels like we all agreed to do it together rather than say governments telling their people right we're now going to tax you for your carbon we're now going to price carbon into the right. food products in the supermarket in the hypermarket yeah. or I I um I, I should say at this point that I'm I'm Cuban and I was I grew up in Cuba and cool. government is not the solution. Government <laughs> is the solution. Yeah, but nice. government is not because no. um if Trump had, had his way, we would have ended up with, like Cuba in this place. Yeah. So and then I wouldn't know where to go. <laughs> and yeah. um so um, I don't think we're all going to sit down around the table and agree that we're going to have five flights a year and six flights a year. A committee may say, you know, we should cut on our flights. And somebody will say, no, why should I cut on our flights? Okay. But 90% of that committee says, yeah, we should cut on flights. And it will be more of, of you pledging six flights a year or three flights a year or 10 flights a year, you pledging that much, not the community agreeing on six. Oh, because six is between five and seven, it's a magical number mm. and all that stuff. So I don't think it'll be in mandate. It'll be more of a pledge for the community to let's try to stick to three. And if we do more than three, then uh, I agree to give some of my rats to to a banner. It's another part of yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So there there will be things like that, and then and then this community will have overlap with this community, and this community will say, "Oh, in the other previous community, we limited the number of flights," and and we say, "Oh no, we get a plane that flies with sunlight, but we can only do two flights a year." Yeah, and then these people will say, "Oh, we'll do. The, I pledge three over here. I'll do two with you, which count for nothing. So uh, I, I can do three and two five, and so there'll be that kind of an organic thing, yeah. um, and and this stuff can travel pretty quickly, again because of this puppy and the overlap that we have over over all over the world. I I mean." I talk to people from all over the world every day. Um, and, and I don't fly anymore, right? I, I'm down to one flight a year or two, and that's yeah. it. Um, and so um, and I'm, we're planning to go to Europe uh, and do a, a round thing on trains. Yeah, it's cool. It's, it's a slightly smaller uh, carbon footprint, but it's, it's better than getting a plane and all that stuff. So, yeah. um, but, but, I, but I think if you mandated, no, you can't do a flight on me, I would say, oh yeah, screw you. That's exactly right. And I think that's what's going to, that's the, the interesting tension will be like, um, if you say to someone, I don't know, like a plumber with a vat, with a, a truck, right? And you say, you're going to, you're sorry, you can't, 
you say to the you say to the plumber, you can't fill up your truck with gas this week. You know, you can just see the um, the pushback will be kind of significant. There is this interesting uh, number which I've come across a, a few times, which is, and I haven't read the actual study, but it says that once twenty five percent of the population is behaving in a certain way, then it's the tipping point. It's the point at which the remainder will come across and you just need to get to 25%. And, and I think what's, I think what's happening in some parts of society now in both in the States and in Europe elsewhere and not everywhere and not distributed evenly, but it's yeah. the beginning of subtle shifts like that. Probably yeah, more like I, 15%. I, I, I think I've read the same, mm. the same thing and, and 25 is tipping point, but whatever it is, it's exponential. You know, so if you start here, yeah, that's cool. you grow that's exponential, right. and, and some people go to extremes, one flight per year, no flights per year, we get to walk everywhere. Uh, and some people will go, oh, we'll do 10 a year, and you can trade them, and stuff like that, and we'll find the middle. So it's not, I don't believe in man mandates. Um, I don't believe in mandates at the point of account. I don't believe in mandates. Uh, at the point of a lawsuit or a point of throwing me in jail or anything like that, um, appeal to my appeal to me, yeah, you know, and, and and that'll get you a lot further than telling me what to do because I'm a jury. I'm gonna go. Well, screw you. I'm not gonna do that. Why? I don't know. But he said X, and I like I like Y now. Um, so, um, so yeah, I don't believe in mandates. Mm. So I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad that we are, we had the same intentions like you. I believe this will happen mm. one way or the other. Um, it's just we're, tr I, we're trying to accelerate, it, you know, a little. Because the problem is, right now we, we. We feel the pain. I just read a, a, um, an article that this been an explosion in pain, in anxiety, and depression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now my ch my children, but it got my older child, um, which is now forty, has been suffering from depression for a long time. It turns out that it was anxiety, and now that they they figured out there was anxiety. They give him medication for anxiety. He's he's totally functional, totally functional, and um, and and to me, it's that younger people, people post nineteen seventy two, um, have been closer to the pain. The the, the economy has been going that way. Of course, wealth of the few of selected ones that are going that way, but they've had less opportunities um, and stuff like that. And they don't, they can detect, they can sense the fiat system, even though they don't, they don't, they don't have a name for it. They can sense that it's painful. It's not me. I, I, I was fully fiat. I was like, and I am full of fiat in, in a lot of ways, um, in that, um, you know, if something hurt, that's good. Let's, let's make it hurt more and, uh, and stuff like that. And, but then my kids, and my kids are, are 82, 85, um, but they feel that pain more readily than I did. Mm -hmm. And they says, well, I don't, I don't like that pain, but I don't like the pain I'm not eating. So how do I coordinate, how do I make the two work? And uh, and the explosion of, of anxiety and depression, what we call anxiety and depression, really comes from being closer to the pain, being more compressed into the pain. And, um, and when you get really compressed to the pain, what happens is a revolution, a bloody revolution. Um, it happened in England many I mean, centuries ago, and mm. uh, it happened in France at about the time that we had ours, and then we broke away from 
King George or whatever. And, um, but think of, think of Germany. Germany was compressed and compressed and compressed and they had a revolution. And the revolution had a name, Hitler, but it could have, it would have been anything else. It would have been a taking over the generals. It would have been, it would have been bloody and it would have been bad for the rest of the world. So yeah. these guys are sensing the compression sooner. So it gives me hope that they're not going to end up in bloody revolution, but they're resisting it without knowing what they're resisting. So I, I got lots of hopes. So uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm being told here to, oh, next week's guest is Preston Gidding. Without the R, it's not greeting, it's Gidding. Co-founder of Pacfor, and um, I saw in his LinkedIn that he's um, he's in the packing industry, packaging industry, without brick and mortar, meaning without a, uh, a warehouse, and without uh, top-down management. So I'm really curious to see what uh, this guy is doing and stuff like that. Um, so, anyways, uh, thank you, Leo Raymond, for for your time and, and in my pleasure to this in a session yes um and um i'll send you an email inviting you to a group of people that have been guests on this podcast and really is for meeting each other it's yeah. not it's not for me to sell anything it's, it's for meeting each other and see what we can do because you guys are addressing pieces of the puzzle and I'll come mm. bring it together and, and make a bigger thing. And um, for a long time, I thought <clears throat> that we need examples of radical companies and stuff like that. And the answer is no, we don't need examples of that. We need examples of, oh, this is happening over there. That is happening over there. That, you know, and, and build, build a, an organic yeah, a movement that way. Yeah. Novelistic, yeah, that's cool. I like yeah. it. So, um, thank you very much. And um, I think we're going to have our Carlos, we're going to have our going away film thing. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks, Matt. Bye.